Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So welcome to the second lecture on Kathy Mansour's fly in this course on gender and literature. So in the first lecture, which was the introduction lecture, the introductory lecture for this particular text, we talked about uh, the political and cultural conditions which produced this text. So obviously it's a First World War uh, short story. And so we talked a little bit about the demography of the First World War. We talked a little bit about the gender uh, reconfigurations after the First World War. So you know, what, what were the major changes which were brought about, not just uh, at the level of uh, you know, demography, but also the level of psychology, also the level of gender locations uh, after the First World War, especially in Europe, because this is a text which is situated presumably in Europe. Uh, so we talked about how the entire idea of dominant hegemonic masculinity, uh, the construct of dominant hegemonic masculinity was completely changed after the First World War. Uh, primarily, not least, because uh, the number of young men, uh, able-bodied, uh, healthy young men, dropped dramatically after the First World War. So most of the men who were there after the war were either old men who were too old to go to the war, or men who had been paralyzed or traumatized by the war, so non-healthy men. So the, the, the number of healthy young men dropped dramatically. And this particular text, a short story, uh, is a very short short story, it's one of the shortest short stories you'll ever read. But despite its brevity, it's very, very intense and authentic in a way it reflects this cultural condition after the First World War. And also we, we looked at the way in how uh, certain professions, certain occupations, certain uh, you know, public spaces opened up for the women after the First World War. So if you look at any history of the World War, uh, we find from the lenses of gender studies, you find that after the World War, uh, we started having in Europe uh, women bus conductors, women bus drivers, women tram conductors, etc. Uh, and the reason is obviously very simple. There weren't uh, enough men available at that time. There weren't enough able-bodied, functioning men available after the First World War because of this uh, tremendous violence which the war uh, created. Okay? And also uh, the entire, uh, you know, we, we talked about how a uh, little bit about how the medical history changed after the First World War, especially the medical treatment uh, of trauma changed after the First World War. So it moved away from the very uh, materialistic model of uh, electric shock and confinement and corporeal control to a more uh, psychoanalytic model of treatment, which is obviously propounded by someone called Sigmund Freud, who, uh, as you know, uh, is a very important figure in literature, because we have a lot of a very rich uh, tradition of criticism called psychoanalytic criticism, which is something propounded by uh, Freud. And he was actively interested in literature. He looked at literary texts like Hamlet, uh, David Copperfield, uh, which were used uh, as medical histories for Freud as well. So we, give, uh, we, we talked about this background, we talked about this condition which created the fly, this particular short story by Catherine Mansfield, and then we moved into the text and we saw how at the beginning of the short story we have a very uh, particular and clear construct of hegemonic masculinity through the figure of the boss, you know, the, the, the unnamed figure, the boss. And we talked about how uh, the very title of the boss, the very construct of the figure boss uh, is authoritarian, uh, is pro-establishment, he is a patriarchal person, uh, a sort of a phallogocentric person uh, who is very, very comfortable uh, in being in control, who enjoys entitlement, who enjoys privilege, who enjoys a position of authority. And that's how he opens up in the short story, in the fly. And in complete contrast to that, we have a figure called Mr. Woodyfield, uh, who we saw uh, in the previous lecture, uh, how he was increasingly infantilized. He's almost like a little baby. Uh, he can't control his nerves, he can't control his memory. He's someone who's controlled by his woman, his wife, and his daughters. And at this point in the short story, we, we notice how uh, the women in the short story seem to have more control than the men. Uh, and we, we talked about how the women, uh, they allow or don't allow uh, Mr. Woodyfield to go out in the city to behave in a particular way. So they are in control. So they are the people who are controlling Mr. Woodyfield, his behavior, uh, his movements, etc., primarily because he's a sick man. So Mr. Woodyfield, uh, as the old sick man, uh, he represents to a great extent uh, symbolically the decadent masculinity of Europe. And of course, we, we saw, we, we ended the first lecture at the point 
where there was a description of Mr. Woodyfield's wife and daughters uh, going to Belgium to take a look at the grave of their son, Reggie. Uh, it was also mentioned how uh, the grave of Woodyfield's son, the grave of the boss's son, are very close to each other. Now, of course, the boss never mentioned his son uh, till this point in the short story, and we just had a very, very brief and quick glimpse, uh, you know, blink and miss glim uh, glimpse of a little photograph of a boy in the boss's desk, a photograph which it does not draw the attention to of Mr. Woodyfield, who doesn't want to show it off. But we saw a photograph of a young boy in a soldier's uniform, a grave-looking young boy in a soldier's uniform. And after getting a report of Mr. Woodyfield and the way he described his wife and daughters having gone to see the graves of his boy, we get to know, we have the knowledge now that the boss's son too must have fought in the war and must have lost his life in the First World War, something that he doesn't want to talk about too much. Now we ended the first lecture uh, in talking about travel, uh, war tourism, trauma tourism, uh, how an entire idea of going to see the graves of the dead people, uh, it became a big industry after the First World War. And interestingly, uh, travel companies like Thomas Cook, they began to flourish after the First World War, uh, primarily because more and more men and women were interested to travel to see the, the, the last remnants of the young, of their loved ones, uh, the graves of the, last, of the loved ones, the people, the places where the people died. So those become, uh, became places of tourist interest after the First World War. So the entire industry of tourism, the entire industry of trauma tourism, it sounds a bit of an oxymoron, but that's the way we describe it, trauma tourism, uh, it flourished. It sort of really came in in a big way after the First World War. And Woodfield's uh, wife and daughters, they embody, uh, as travelers, when they go to Belgium to see the graves of the sons, they embody this trauma tourism, they embody this tourist uh, who went after the First World War to, to take a look around the places where their loved ones uh, died. Right? So Woodyfield talks about uh, how their wife and daughters went to Belgium to take a look at Reggie's grave, and Reggie's grave happens to be quite close to the boss's son's grave. Uh, and then he moves on, he digresses, and he moves on to talk about the price of jam in the hotel in which the, the, the woman was staying. So obviously the, the focus shifts from the trauma to the tourism. Uh, so he talks about the price of jam, he talks about you know, how the, the garden parts are so nicely maintained. It's as if he's gone to a little, you know, a little tourist museum which is to be well maintained and they obviously have to pay a ticket to get in. So it's, it's completely linked with an industry of travel, the industry of tourism. So as you can see, this is something which came up historically. So this is again a very important bit. In this short story, despite its brevity, is so deeply embedded in a real historical condition. It's so deeply reflective of the real historical condition. That's why it's a significant short story. Okay, so uh, Woodyfield's description of his uh, wife and daughters going to Belgium to take a look at the son's grave is very authentic. It's exactly what happened after the First World War. And then th th this is what he wanted to tell to the boss. This is what he, to, want, what he wanted to say to the boss. He come all the way to see the boss to report this, that, you know, my wife and daughters went to Belgium to take a look at my son's grave, and they happened to come by your son's grave, which is also there quite close by. So your son's grave and our son's grave are quite close to each other, and they're very peaceful, uh, it's very well maintained, etc. Okay, so this is a point in the short story where the entire uh, logic begins to change. And, and we, we talked about how in, in the previous lecture, how this entire idea of the woman traveling and coming back and reporting to the men is the complete opposite of what we saw in Heart of Darkness, where the men had traveled, had the adventure, or the misadventure, came back and lied to the men, women uh, who were insiders, who had no idea about what was happening in the uh, empire, the outposts of the empires. So the Kurtz is intended in Heart of Darkness, for example, is misinformed, is lied to, he gets, she gets a false romantic report of Kurtz's life and death. Uh, which she never gets to know because she doesn't, she must never know what really happened in the, in the colonies, in the uh, outposts of the colonies. And in complete contrast to this, we have the Woodyfield's wife and daughters going to Belgium to take a look at the son's grave and coming back and reporting to the men. Uh, and then of course, reporting also about the jam prices, about the price of hotels, about the nice broad garden parts, etc., which is a very touristy kind of a report. So the men stay back, the men are paralyzed to travel, they're too paralyzed to travel, uh, you know, they can't travel because of medical reason, they can't travel because of psychological reason, and it's the woman who travel, the woman who take control, the woman who decide, the woman who have agency after the First World War. So in a, in a very interesting sense, uh, I mentioned in the previous lecture how the First World War was an emancipation, was the beginning of the end of this phallogocentric, Eurocentric domination. Right? So it's the beginning of the end of this phallogocentric control of women and the, and the non-white people. Uh, 
right? So it's the beginning of the end of imperialism, it was the beginning of the end of patriarchy as you know it, as you knew it before that. So it was the beginning of the emancipation of women, it was the beginning of the freedom of the colonies, etc. It all began to take place after the First World War. So in that case, in that sense, the First World War may be regarded, quite rightly so, as a massive paradigm shift. Uh, in the masculinist economy, in the gender economy uh, that prevailed in Europe at that point of time. So the fly by Catherine Mansfield is a very authentic, is a very complex short story which deals with these topics, which deals with these themes. So we, we came to the point in the short story in the previous lecture where Woodyfield remembered after having drunk the whiskey that the boss had offered him, he remembered what he had come to tell the boss, he remembered that what his wife and daughters had told him uh, about the son's grave, about the boss's son's grave and he relayed the report to the boss. He said to him that you know, your son's grave is very well kept, your son's grave is very well looked after. And then he asks this very innocuous question to the boss. You had never been uh, abroad, have you? You've never been there to see your son's grave, have you? And the boss just says no. And the narrative informs us, for various reasons, he had not been abroad. For various reasons, he had not been there. So, you know, we, we, get, we get a sense of this is perhaps getting a bit dark now. This is perhaps getting a bit uh, really complex now. So the story began in a very simplistic, binaristic kind of a way where the boss was a typically manly man, where the boss was completely in control, the boss was someone who was, you know, he had you know, a newly decked up office, a very phallic architecture in his office, uh, drinking whiskey, reading the Financial Times. So very manly, metonymic signifiers of manliness, you know, whiskey, Financial Times. So, you know, he's someone who is a complete no, uh, is a completely on the ball about finance, is completely, uh, you know, in control of his nerves, so he's drinking whiskey, which is a very manly drink. So everything was perfectly going for him in terms of this manly construct or the constructive manliness that he wanted to embody. Now, uh, this is the point in the short story where that begins to change when, uh, you know, uh, Winifield informs him about his son's death, uh, about his, reminds him of his son's death. Of course, he knows his son is dead, but he reminds him of his son's death and he informs that the fact that, you know, the son's grave is very well looked after in Belgium, very close to where Winifield's, grave's, uh, Winifield's son's grave is, and then it departs. So what if he leaves the scene after having relayed this report to the boss? Okay? So the entire significance of Woodyfield is very important in this short story. Uh, what is Woodyfield doing? So Woodyfield starts off as a, as, as, as a contrast to the boss, uh, as a construct of const uh, contrast. He's the opposite. Uh, so he's very carefully constructed uh, as a contrast to the boss. Okay? So he's frail, he's old, he's wearing a muffler, he's enervated, he's completely exhausted, he, he's on his way out, he's completely you know, non, in, in, not in control. In other words, he's not really a manly man. In complete contrast to the boss, who really turns out to be a very manly man, turns out to be this, you know, really a stereotypically manly man who's drinking whiskey and reading the Financial Times. Now, uh, this was the initial purpose that would have been served in the short story. But then again, it gets more complex, as I said. So he remembers uh, the fact that you know, his son's grave was in Belgium, and so is his, the boss's son's grave, and it, and it tells that to the boss. And this is the beginning of the end of the boss's effort to construct himself as a manly man. Okay? So this report really, uh, you know, we, we get to see the short story, how this particular report really uh, you know, collapses the constructive boss's masculinity. You know, it really begins to attack this entire idea of masculinity that he wants to embody so heavily right, as a socially successful, emotionally successful, personally successful person. Right? And this begins to give away with this particular report. So what if it goes away in the short story having relayed this report to the boss? Now, as soon as Woodyfield goes away, uh, the boss begins to crumble. So we see a, a complete change in the short story where the boss travels from uh, solidity to fragility. And this is what I said, I mentioned in a previous lecture as well. This entire story is about a, a transition, a shift from solidity to fragility. It's sort of moving away uh, into a fragile construct. Okay? Now, the moment Woodyfield goes away, the boss, uh, you know, boss sees him out, comes back to his office, shuts the door, and then instructs that he is not to be disturbed. So he tells his secretary, someone called Macy. Now, interestingly, uh, the names of the seemingly insignificant people uh, are there in the short story. So we get to know the boss's secretary's name. We get to know Woodyfield's name. We even get to know, uh, you know, Woodyfield's son's name. But interestingly, the boss's name we never get to know. It's just called the boss. The boss's son's name again we never get to know. It's just called the boy, right? And it's interestingly, so those of us who are interested in a symbolic study of this particular short story would know that the boss rep represents the every man that father figure, the every man who's lost his son uh, to the war. And the boss's son, uh, again, re represents the every man, the young man, the face of the young man who died in the war. Okay? So they are unnamed, they're anonymous, they're replaceable. So these are, the boss represents the patriarch, the, the patriarch who had 
whose drive for expansion, whose drive for control, whose drive for success had really caused the war, right? The, the patriarch, the patriarchal principle which had caused the war, the First World War and the causality of the war. And so interestingly, and in a very similar vein, the boss's son represents uh, the, the martyr, the, the, the fodder, who was sent out to the war uh, in order to satisfy the masculine's desire for expansion, for control, uh, for, you know, territorialization. And so his death uh, is a very symbolic death. His death is basically uh, a disruption, a destruction of this masculine's desire of territorialization and control. This entire masculine is hubris of expansion, territorialization, this megalomaniac, uh, you know, desire for more and more success, etc., which was basically which caused the war, right? So the boss represents the patriarch, the megalomaniac patriarch, whose desire for territorialization uh, is basically the driving impulse of the First World War. And the boss's son who died in the First World War represents the martyr, represents the person who is sent off to satisfy the desire of the, of the, of the father, you know, to expand, to control, to territorialize. And so his death embodies in a very interesting way, in a very symbolic way, the, the, the failure of this masculinist project. The, the monstrosity of this masculinist project. So in a way, and we mentioned this in a previous lecture, in a way the entire story can be read as a feminist satire, a feminist critique, a very scathing feminist critique of this entire megalomaniac you know, desire for expansion, territorialization, etc. So Mansfield is writing from a feminist position, Mansfield is writing from a position of critique uh, in this particular short story. So as we see, as the story progresses from this point, the boss gets more and more emasculated, the boss gets more and more stripped down. So his entire construct of dressing up as this uh, big man uh, surrounded by big gadgets, surrounded by these big machines in this office, uh, that has been taken away gradually in the short story. So he comes back in this office room, he comes back, uh, shuts the door, uh, sits back in his desk, in his, in his sofa, uh, in his armchair, sorry, and instructs not to be disturbed. And then uh, he, he begins to remember, he begins to relive. The, the, the loss of his son. He begins to uh, re-mourn the loss of his son. Okay? Now, he, he talks about how uh, it's, been, it's really shocking for him where uh, this entire idea of Woodyfield's wife and daughters looking at the son's grave. Uh, you know, he gets his image, uh, he replays his image in his mind, and that's a very disturbing image for him because uh, he feels as if, the narrative tells us, he feels as if the grave has opened up and the, boss, uh, uh, the son is lying inside the grave, unblemished. Uh, and Woodfield's wife and daughters are looking at the dead son inside the grave. So this again, this entire gaze uh, is reversed over here, as you can see. So it's a woman gazing at the dead man. It's a woman who is gazing at the powerless dead man, right? So the entire uh, powerful man who's supposed to be gazing, who's supposed to be controlling, who's supposed to be uh, territorializing, territorializing, who's supposed to be expanding, uh, etc. Uh, you know, but that particular man, that particular construct, that particular condition, that particular uh, desire is dead. So the, the son, the death of the son is basically the death of this masculinist desire, the desire for expansion, uh, the, the, the desire for profit, the desire for control, the desire for imperialism, the desire for economic expansion, etc. Et the entire desire is death. So in, in a very interesting way, the death of the son is a death of desire, the death of the masculinist desire. And this entire image of the, the, the image that the boss has in his mind that the Woodyfield's wife and daughters are looking at the grave and as if the grave is opening up and the son is lying in the grave helplessly and the woman is staring at him. So it's almost like a, you know, it's a castrating kind of a story. It's a woman staring at the man who is now castrated, who is now emasculated symbolically, symbolically castrated, symbolically taken off, uh, you know, and his masculinity is gone. So that kind of a stare, uh, that kind of a gaze is now given to the woman. So in a way, the boss feels frightened of the woman. And of course, I mean, as you can see in this particular short story, so except Woodyfield's uh, you know, wife and daughters who are mentioned in the short story, there is no other mention of any other woman. We never get to need, we never get to know, uh, by the way, of the boss's wife. We never get to know of the boss's son's mother, uh, whether he had a mother, a biological mother. Of course he had a biological mother, whether that was a legal mother, whatever, we never get to know. So it's absent presence of the woman, the absent presence of the mother figure in the short story is very, very interesting. So it's almost as if, the boss had tried to own, he had an absolute ownership on the son, which does not, did not require the presence of the mother figure, which doesn't require seemingly the presence of the intervention of any female, right? So it's almost as if the man can control his progeny absolutely and unconditionally. The man seems to have absolute ownership on his progeny. And he, he, that's this kind of idea, that's the kind of image that is given to us in this particular short story. And very quickly, we get to know that the boss had this enormous ambition for the son. 
the boss had this ambition that he has built his empire. And the word empire comes in a short story, very interestingly. So his business, uh, you know, appears to him as an empire. And he sort of says that the entire idea was for the son to take over and carry on from where he had left off. So again, we see this entire expansionist desire, the desire to expand, the desire to move on, the desire to uh, territorialize, to take control, to make more profit. Uh, you know, the, again, this is very, very male, very, very masculine, it's very, very phallocentric desire. And that desire is disrupted. That desire is dead. So like I said, the death of the sun over here is symbolically the death of desire, the death of this masculinist desire for control, expansion, territorialization, etc. And that is something which is very symbolically uh, in a present in this particular short story in, in, in a very heavy kind of a way. So the, the dead sun in this particular short story is a very symbolic non-presence, is a very symbolic figure uh, whose death represents the death of desire, the death of this ambition, this masculine ambition for control, expansion, territorialization, etc. This entire megalomaniacal expansion, uh, this entire megalomaniacal desire for expansion, for territorialization is now disrupted, thwarted uh, with the death of the sun. Okay, so uh, the, the, the story begins to become really complex and psychological from this point. Uh, so the boss sits with, uh, in, in his office uh, thinking of the enormous uh, loss that has happened to him because of the death of the son. Uh, and also we get to see that you know, his loss, you know, his experience of loss, his experience of bereavement for the son is not so emotional as it is masculinist. So this entire idea is now that the son is dead, what is going to happen to this empire? Now that the son is dead, uh, what is going to happen to this business? Uh, who's going to expand the business? Who's going to uh, you know, perpetrate this business? So again, if you go back and give you this four P's, uh, you know, the production, uh, promotion, protection and preservation or perpetuation. Right? So production, promotion, protection and perpetuation. So the four P's which were governing the phallocentric principle of you know, control, territorialization and expansion. So the four P's over here play with each other uh, and obviously the boss had produced this economy, the boss had produced this empire. Now we need, he needs someone to, to perpetuate it, to expand it, uh, to preserve it. And, but that particular presence is now gone. That particular figure who was supposed to preserve it, who was supposed to perpetuate it, who was supposed to expand it further is now gone. Uh, you know, the death of the sun again, so the death of the desire, death of future for the boss. So it doesn't really have a future. His business doesn't have a future really uh, in a proper sense. So again we see the loss that he experiences, this, the, the bereavement that he suffers is not so emotional as masculinist. It's a very masculinist kind of a bereavement. It's a very masculinist kind of a death of desire. Right? And that is something that he keeps saying uh, over and over again in the course of the short story. Now, what happens in this particular short story from this point is really psychological and complex. So uh, the boss, uh, we get to know that the boss had uh, really suffered uh, and it makes it very, very clear you know, to, to, the, to the reader that he's really suffered the, the loss of his son. Uh, and more importantly, he also mentions, he also seems to indicate that his suffering is in a way a very unique kind of a suffering. Right? It's something which is very unique, it's something which is very, very uh, you know, special to him. Uh, because, you know, and that again, that is part of the hubris of the boss. You know, you, you know the meaning of the word hubris, it means false pride. Right? It's not just pride, it's false pride. A false pride which brings about a downfall of a particular figure. It's, it's a term from a Greek tragedy, uh, so like peripetia, uh, you know, hamatia, uh, hubris is a term which means false pride. It, it's something which uh, lots of epic heroes have uh, which bring about the downfall eventually. So the boss in this particular short story, he has his hubris uh, of masculinist arrogance. He has his hubris of masculinist expansion and control. Now, his hubris extends to this point that he actually states that his suffering, his loss is unique. Right? So the fact that he has lost his son is to be seen as a unique experience of loss. Now the fact that millions of people lost their sons and you know, millions of people lost their loved ones in the world uh, you know, doesn't occur to him. So that's unimportant, that's reductionist, that's redundant to him. Right? Now he needs to insist, he needs to dramatize his own unique sense of loss. Okay, and it tells you, it tells the reader quite clearly, uh, and the narrative also informs us that uh, you know he has refused to move on, right? He has refused to reconcile to the fact that his son is dead. So he is not someone who is going to move on from the sense of loss because his loss is unique. His sense of loss, his sense of bereavement is so special, is so unique that other people might move on, other people might live the loss down, but not he. And it actually says these lines do appear in the short story if you read it. Uh, other men might live the loss down, uh, but not he. How is it possible? His entire life has no meaning except for the sun.
Okay, uh, and so uh, we, we get to know the picture, we get to see this flashback narrative where we, 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 are, we are shown how the boss and the son would travel together on a train every single day, uh, how the son was picking up uh, the, the tricks of the trade very, very quickly. He was becoming popular with the uh, people in the office. Everyone had a good word for him and he had this boyish charm and would say simply splendid every time something happened. So this entire idea, this entire masculinist construct of the son is very uh, subtly and very skillfully given to us. So he's this boyish man who is about to become a real man and the boss is sort of training him. The boss is basically taking him in into his fold and you know masculinizing, masculinizing him in a way. So he sort of he was about he was on a cusp of uh, boyhood and manlyhood and he had his boyish charm of saying simply splendid about anything. Whenever he was happy, he would just say simply splendid again. It's very very boyish. But he was learning the trade very very quickly. He was very quickly becoming manly. He was very quickly becoming a good businessman. Right, who would fit in perfectly, who would fit into the T to the, to the point where the boss had left off. He would take it off from there and he would expand it infinitely ad infinitum, uh, and the boss's empire would be in safe hands. Well, this was a point where he was summoned where, by the war, he was sent off to the war, and then the boss had received a telegram one fine day which mentioned, We deeply regret to inform you, and that was the beginning of his end, the death of the sun, which was not just the death of a human being, but also, more importantly, the death of desire. And it's something I want to emphasize, the, the debt of desire for the boss, his desire for expansion, territorialization, profit making, all this desire, this entire network of desire comes to an end, a very dramatic end uh, with the death of his son. Okay? So this was the entire symbolic significance for the son's death. Now, attached to this, attached to his uh, uh, you know, incessant need to feel privileged and authoritative uh, and special uh, is also the fact that how he makes this uh, sorrow very, very privileged. How it makes this loss very, very privileged. He actually says that, that other men would live their loss down, but I would never live my loss down because you know, my son is a very special son. It's my son. So this entire narcissistic principle that he attaches, this entire narcissistic desire that he attaches to even his loss is something almost pathological. It's this ego, this entire self-inflated ego, this entire self-inflated narcissism, which again is very masculinist, is now attributed even in its loss. So he actually says that my, my experience of loss is so special, so unique, that it can never be recovered from, it can never be uh, moved away from. I can never move on uh, from the sense of loss, from the sense of sorrow, from the sense of you know, uh, bereavement that I've just suffered with the death of my son. Okay, so at this point in the short story, uh, things get really uh, psychological, you know, neurotic, hysteric. Okay, and he used the word hysteric quite, quite carefully over here because, as you know, uh, the entire construct of hysteria, medically uh, and culturally, uh, was attributed to the female, right, to the woman. So, uh, very stereotypically, this very sexist kind of a, um, you know, division line between men and women uh, was spilled. This sort of spilled over also in the, in the realm of diseases, in the realm of medicine, whereby hysteria was a female malady. Okay, there's a very fine book by Ellen Shawalter called The Female Malady. If you want to read more about the history of hysteria, you would know that you know, traditionally, uh, you know, medically, it was said to be a disease from the womb. Uh, right? uh, so hysteria, the word hysteria actually comes from you know, something which comes from the womb. And females are womb, so all the females could be hysteric. So hysteria, or in other words, the, the loss of emotional control, the loss of nervous control, the loss of rational control uh, was supposed to be a very female condition, right? Because rationality was male, right? Logic was male, uh, you know, control was male. So any, any deviation, any departure from these constructs would be automatically classified as female, right? So hysteria was a female malady. Hysteria was something which happened to women alone. And this is the point uh, in the short story where we, we get to see how hysteria is sort of reconfigured uh, in this particular context and it becomes, in a very interesting sense, it becomes masculinist. So what happens in this point in the short story is very, very interesting. The boss, you know, he wants to relive the loss of his son. He wants to re-feel the loss of his son. He wants to re-feel or revisit uh, his original moment of trauma, his original moment of loss. So what does it do? He shuts the door. He produces this uh, photograph of the sun, which we saw in the very opening page, uh, and very cleverly the narrative told us, uh, uh, and it told us that, you know, this was something which uh, the boss did not draw the attention to, but it was there in this table somehow, but for some reason doesn't show it off in a way he shows off his electric heating and financial times and whiskey. Uh, those are things that shows up, but not this particular thing. This is something of a hidden object uh, in his desk. Uh, 
Now that particular hidden object now is brought forward, is now foregrounded. And the boss looks at the photograph and what does he want to do? He wants to cry, right? Uh, he wants to, uh, so this has been years after the death of his son, four years have passed, uh, you know, but he still wants to cry. He still wants to relive or revisit or re-experience the original moment of loss. Now therein lies the hubris of the boss. Therein lies the male pride of the boss. Now interestingly, the male pride at this point is equated with the ability to be hysteric. Now it is really complex because as I just mentioned, the hysteria is traditionally a female malady. But the wasp wants to feel special, not just in his social position but also in his grief. So he says he wants to prove to the world and to himself more importantly that he can still cry, he can still be hysteric even after four years after the son's death. Right? So, uh, in, in other words, his masculinity now is mediated or is determined by his ability to be hysteric. So, I said it again because it's a very complex point. His masculinity is mediated and is determined by his ability to be hysteric, to be hysterical, right? So, hysteria over here uh, moves away from being a female malady and actually becomes a masculinist condition. Interestingly, whereby the boss wants to be hysteric, the boss wants to perform hysteria in order to prove to himself that his, uh, this very hubristic belief that he has in his mind, that his sorrow, his grief is somehow so special that he hasn't moved on, that he is, is incapable of moving on. He is, he is someone, you know, is something that he cannot move on from because it is so special and so unique to him. Right? And that is something that he wants to feel, that is something that he wants to prove to himself over and over again. And that's the reason why this particular short story gets really complex because it conflates the different gender dynamics over here. So in order to be manly over here, you just don't have to be rational, you just don't have to be unemotional. In order to be manly over here, you must also be, be able to perform hysteria. Now I use the word perform quite interestingly because that takes us back to, if you remember to our original reading of performance and performativity, uh, how you're trying to produce an effect. You're trying to produce a spectacular effect. Uh, and in the case of the boss over here, uh, the spectacle is something that he wants to consume. In other words, he wants to consume his own hysteric self. He wants to produce hysteria, he wants to perform hysteria and thereby in the process he will tell himself over and over again that I'm still capable of grieving the loss of my son. I'm still capable of mourning the loss of my son in a very special way, right? In a way which is very unique to me because my loss is so unique. Okay, so do you get the point? So the point over here is the boss is trying to be hysteric in order to be manly. And it's sort of a paradox over here, but that's exactly what is happening in this particular short story. The boss, in order to feel manly, is trying to be hysteric. Because you know, if he manages to be hysteric, if he manages to cry, if he manages to relive the original moment of loss, he'll prove to himself in a manly kind of a way that I have not moved on. In other words, I have defied the healing effect of time. So I am such a strong man, I am such a manly man that I have defied the healing effect of time. So four years have passed, years have passed, but then that has had no effect on me. That has had no, you know, healing effect on me. I'm still capable of reliving, I'm still capable of feeling the original moment of loss, which was the moment of death for the son. That original moment when the, when the news came to me that my son is dead, I'm still capable of feeling and re-feeling and reliving that moment. And no amount of time, no quantity of time, no flow of time is capable of healing me. No flow of time is capable of changing me. So I am unchangeable, in other words. My grief is unchangeable. My mourning is unchangeable. It's a very masculine kind of a mourning. It's a very manly kind of a mourning. And I'm someone uh, who, is, who defies time completely. So you know, time will have no effect on me. Other men would live their loss down. Other men might move on. Other men might forget but I will never forget, right? So this entire effort to defy time, this entire effort to defy forgetfulness, this entire effort to, you know, defeat time, defeat forgetfulness, defeat memory is something that the boss wants to do as part of his manly program, okay? So you can see the masculinity of the boss over here, it spills over from financial times and whiskey into memory and, you know, performativity and hysteria, okay? So he wants to relive the moment of original trauma. He wants to relive and revisit and, and, and do it again and again and again and ad infinitum. He, he wants to perform masculine you know, hysteria. He wants to be performatively hysteric in order to be manly uh, at this point of time. 
So this is a very interesting uh, conundrum, a very interesting paradox, which Mansfield brilliantly uh, describes in this particular short story. And that's the reason why it's such a complex short story. It's so political, so cultural, but at the same time, it's so psychologically dense in the short story. And that's the reason why it's one of the finest short stories ever written in the history of English literature, perhaps of any literature for that matter. Okay, so this is the condition that a boss finds himself in. This is the condition that a boss uh, is trying to relive. He, he, wants, he wants to shut the door, uh, shut off from everything and cry again, right? Relive the original moment of trauma. But of course, when he tries to cry, he cannot cry. So very clearly, it, it, it is revealed to us the boss cannot cry. He tries again. He says, my son groaned the boss, but no tears came yet. So, you know, this is the beginning of the end of the boss. This is the beginning of the end of his hubris, in a way. So, he had very hubrisly declared to himself, to the world, that he can never live his loss down. He can never move on from his loss. But here he is, uh, trying to cry, but realizing that he has to, whether he wants to, wants to or not, he has to been forcefully, you know, been forced to move on by time. So, time too has healed him, in a way. Time too has made him forget the original moment of trauma. So he just sits there very, very puzzled. He just sits there very, very you know, helpless and doesn't know what to do. He's trying again and again uh, to perform hysteria. He's trying again and again uh, to relive the moment of original trauma in order to make himself feel very special, but he cannot do it. So at this point of the short story, we have what we call the fly episode in the short story. And interestingly, the name of the story, story is a fly. And again, it's a very psychological episode where we see the boss doing something very, very psychological and very complex. So the entire episode, the fly episode, is an example of what we call sadomasochism. It's a combination of sadism and masochism. So sadism, of course, as we know, is the pleasure someone derives by torturing others. You know, it, you know, it tortures someone verbally, physically, in whatever form, and derive a pleasure out of it. So it's a very complex, it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, um, almost a sickly condition of imagination, whereby you get a satisfaction by seeing someone suffer. That's sadism. Masochism is more complex. Masochism is a, this very, uh, you know, a perverse pleasure principle, whereby you, you get a sense of pleasure by, you know, suffering yourself, right? So you suffer yourself, you know, either physically or emotionally or verbally, in, 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 ideationally, in any form that you desire. And that suffering that you go through, uh, you know, very perversely produces pleasure in you. It produces a pleasure principle in you. So sadomasochism is a combination of these two pleasure principles. It's sadism as well as masochism. So what happens in a fly episode is this. Uh, the boss sits there very puzzled. The boss sits there unable to know, uh, you know what to do at this point of time because he's trying to cry but he cannot cry uh, and he's realizing with increasing uh, you know, uh, you know, defeat that it, it maybe time has moved on and maybe he's forgotten and he's trying to cry. He's trying his best to remember, re-hyphen remember his original self, re-hyphen live his original self, self uh, the original moment of trauma, but he cannot. So he sits there very, very puzzled where he notices a fly inside the ink pot. So there's an ink pot in front of him uh, and he notices a fly inside the ink pot. Uh, and somehow his focus shifts uh, to the fly inside the ink pot. And for some reason, uh, it brings out a pen and it helps the fly come out of the ink pot. So he takes the fly uh, out of the ink pot and puts it on a blotting paper. Right? So this is the first condition. He takes the fly out and puts it in the blotting paper. And then he sees the fly begin to dry itself. So the fly you know, begins to dry itself by you know, fluttering its wings, uh, it's sort of bringing in the air to the wings and in the process is sort of shedding off the ink, the blot of ink which is uh, uh, on its body and in the process is making itself more and more light and preparing for flight. So it wants to go away, uh, you know, wants to fly away after it has dried itself. Now at that point of time, the boss has a very perverse idea. The boss has a very, uh, you, know, uh, you know, weird, strange kind of an idea. So what does he do? He puts in his, uh, uh, you know, the pen inside the ink pot, makes out, you know, pulls it out, gets a blob of ink, and drops the blob of ink on the fly again. So in the first instance, he helped the fly come out of the ink pot. Now we saw it, uh, you know, uh, you know how it was trying to make itself light, trying to make itself free, trying to get rid of the ink. Uh, in the process, he, he somehow something happens in his brain, and he decides that maybe he should torture the fly to see how he handles it. Okay, so he drops his pen back. He, he dips his pen back in the, in the ink pot, pulls it out again, and drops a blot of ink on the fly to see what the fly does. And so the fly, uh, it is, obviously, is very cowed. The fly is obviously very, very shocked. You know, it comes to it in a very heavy kind of a way, and a, a drop of ink 
uh, blot of ink for the fly is a very heavy thing. So uh, there's a moment of stillness, there's a moment of silence, and then a second later, a few seconds later, the fly begins the process again. The process of drying itself off the ink, right? And the boss again observes it. The boss observes, so he, he begins to feel admiration towards the fly, he begins to really admire the fly, his effort to move on, his effort to you know, deal with shock, deal with trauma, deal with loss. And that, that becomes, in a very interesting way, a reflection of his own manly effort to deal with loss, his own manly effort to deal with defeat. So the fly, the fly is trying to deal with defeat, deal with loss in a way which is very, very manly according to the boss. So the boss is all admiration for the fly. Okay? So he drops this blot of ink on the fly uh, and you know, sees the fly dry itself again. And the fly manages to dry itself, it is almost free, it is almost dry and it is prepared for flight when the boss does it again. He puts his pen back into the uh, ink pot, uh, pulls out uh, with a pen filled with ink and drops another blob of ink on the fly. Okay? Again to see how the fly handles it. And the fly, uh, you know, is obviously getting weaker with time because, you know, the process of drying is a very uh, heavy process, it's a very muscular process and it's taking a toll on its uh, ability, it's taking a toll on its, uh, you know, physicality. So the fly is getting weaker, the boss can notice it. So the process began again, but this time more weaker than last time, this time weaker than last time. So the, the fly begins again very laboriously, uh, you know, drying itself. Uh, and the, the image that we have in this particular section is a very interesting image, is the image of a scythe going under a stone. Right? So we have this stone and scythe symbolism by the process of which someone is trying to pull a stone up, a very heavy stone up, uh, you know, by pushing a scythe into it. And this particular image, the scythe and a stone image, uh, obviously it reminds us uh, of the Sisyphus image, you know, the, in the myth of Sisyphus, S-I-S-Y-P-H-U-S, -S Sisyphus. So the myth of Sisyphus is a very important metaphor which was made famous, uh, obviously it's originally a Greek myth, but it was made famous later by Albert Camus, uh, where he talks about the Sisyphus being uh, a metaphor for the purposelessness of man, the pointlessness of man. So the Sisyphus image is an image of someone who's doomed to push a stone up a hill uh, with, just, with the knowledge that the stone will you know, roll back again uh, down the hill and you'll have to push it up again and then the entire process will continue ad infinitum. So again, the Sisyphus image is an image of futility, is an image of purposelessness, an image of pointlessness, an image of defeat. So this entire skite and stone image that Mansfield brings in very, very skillfully at this point in the short story is a reminder of the Sisyphus image. So the fly is trying its best uh, to uh, you know, dry itself, uh, to recover from the shock, to recover from the blow that the boss is giving it. Uh, and then you know, it's trying very hard, this time more weakly than the first time because it's getting weaker physically, uh, to move on uh, and to deal with defeat, to deal with trauma, to deal with loss. Okay? So the boss again looks at the fly uh, and he's, again his admiration grows and he, he actually says, you artful little bastard. Right? And, and the word over here is very, very interesting. He doesn't say the word bastard, but you artful little bee, which obviously uh, represents or the, the word he wants to say is that. But the point is, it's a very manly way to admire someone. Right? It's, not, uh, it's not something which is very affectionate. It's not something which is very emotional. It's a very manly, butch kind of a way. You know, I use the word butch uh, in a very manly, masculine studies kind of a way. It's like a strong man admiring another strong man because of something muscular that is happening, because of something really macho that is ha happening at that point of time. So the fly over here uh, represents or reflects to the boss his own entire masculinist principle of dealing with trauma, dealing with loss, dealing with defeat. Okay? So a second time too, the fly manages to dry itself and the boss has this idea that maybe he should do it one more time, one last time. And the boss dips his pen into the ink pot, takes it out and drops another blob of ink on the fly. And this time the fly does not move, the fly is dead. Now, in the previous section, uh, you know, in, in the previous uh, you know, episode where the fly was drying itself the second time, the boss had actually breathed on it in order to help the drying process. So that is the reason why I mean, when, 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 this is what I mean when I say this is a sadomasochistic process. So in a way, the boss is getting pleasure by seeing this fly suffer, he's getting pleasure by seeing the fly you know, really being tortured, but on the other hand, he wants the fly to win. So he's actually helping the fly in the drying process. He's breathing onto it in order to help the drying process. But at the same time, he's dropping the blot of ink on the fly in order to make it suffer. So it's sadomasochism. So the fly is both the other as well as the self for the boss. So the fly is both the fly for the boss as well as his own reflection of his own self, his own effort to move on, his own effort to reconcile, his own effort to deal with trauma, violence and loss. So the effort of the fly over here is a very uh, 
urgent reminder as a very uh, you know nice reflection for the boss a very complex reflection for the boss uh, you know a reflection of his own effort to deal with defeat to deal with loss to deal with mourning to deal with violence okay so the third time he drops uh, this ink on the uh, a blot of ink on the uh, fly the fly doesn't move anymore so the boss keeps egging it uh, the boss keeps saying come on look sharp look sharp and again this phrase look sharp uh, like you artful little bastard. Again, these are very, very manly phrases. These are phrases uh, spoken by very manly men, men who are successful, men who are big, muscular, socially successful, etc. These are the men who say these kind of phrases. So come on, look sharp. He tries to egg on the fly, but the fly does not move. And the fly, and the, it dawns on the loss that the fly is now finally dead. Okay. So, he takes the fly now, uh, the cops of the fly, uh, and it's very interesting how the fly is increasingly humanized in the process. It's almost like it's magnified and it's almost like a human being. So, the fly becomes uh, almost like a humanized uh, version uh, of the boss's own effort to deal with defeat, to deal with trauma, to deal with loss. Okay. So, in the end, the fly just lies there, uh, dead, uh, and it doesn't move, and the boss you know, takes it out with this uh, pen and, and throws it in the waste paper basket. But the, the narrative tells us very, very clearly that a wretched sense of uh, emptiness consumes them, right? And it feels positively frightened now. Because you know, if the fly had survived, if the fly had, if the fly had managed to move on, if the fly had managed to dry itself the last time, that would have been a, a symbol of hope for the boss, a symbol of uh, regeneration for the boss. But the fact that the fly did not survive, the, the fact that the fly could not survive, the fly was dead in the end, that was something which really scared the boss. So, in a way, it's a very complex psychological episode and it's an episode which brings to the boss, which, you know, it, you know, it lays bare in front of him his own defeat, his own defeat of his masculinist principle of survival, uh, of preservation, of perpetuation. The entire masculinist project of preservation of survival is now coming to an end. And so, the fly became uh, an extension of his manly self. Uh, the self that is struggling to survive, the self that is actually struggling to move on, to control defeat, to control uh, violence, to control loss, uh, you know, but that self is now dead. So, with the fly, that self is now also gone. So, he looks at the fly, he thinks that this grinding feeling of wretchedness seized him uh, and he felt positively frightened, the narrative tells us. He's so frightened now. So, no longer is he this manly boss, no longer is he this manly person in control. And the story ends with the boss summoning his secretary, Macy, and asking him to bring some fresh blotting paper and trying again to be very manly, saying, look, look sharp about it, okay? Do it very quickly, look sharp about it, uh, bring me some fresh blotting paper. But deep inside, the narrative tells us, and the final sentence of the story is this, uh, you know, and he sat down there trying to remember what he was thinking about before. But for the life of him, this is the final sentence, for the life of him, he could not remember. And isn't this reminiscent of what happened to Woodyfield at the beginning? Uh, this very fragile old figure in the muffler who could not remember what he'd come to tell the boss? Isn't this exactly where the boss ends with? So, isn't this, this is like a, a bit of a conflation of the two extremes? So, the, the story had opened you know, uh, with like Boss and Woodyfield as two complete contrasts to each other in a masculinity map. The boss is solid, robust, healthy, and Woodyfield is feeble, emasculated, infantilized. But the story ends with a conflation of these three opposites. So, the boss ends up being Woodyfield, the boss ends up being completely uh, emasculated, the boss ends up being completely enervated, exhausted, and it doesn't quite know how to deal with things anymore. For the life of him, he could not remember. So, he cannot remember what happened to him. He cannot remember what he was thinking of. He cannot remember what he had in his mind before the fly episode. So, with the fly episode, with the dead fly, what also dies is the boss's manly, rational, controlling self. So, that gets his final defeat that is actually finally killed in this particular process, this entire pseudo-masochistic episode, which, the, which is paradoxically authored by the boss himself. Right? He is the author of this particular episode. So, he in a way uh, annihilates his own manly self. Right? So, uh, prior to that, we have seen how this manly self had desperately tried to cry, tried to be hysteric in order to prove to itself that it is still fresh. The wound that he has in his mind of the, of the son's death is still forever fresh. It will remain forever fresh. And that too was defeated. He could not cry, as we could see. He tried many times to cry. He was trying to perform hysteria. He looked at a photograph several times, tried to evoke, tried to generate tears, but tears did not come. 
So, and then he moved on uh, to this fly episode. He wanted the fly to suffer, but at the same time, he wanted the fly to win by dropping blots of ink on it. And in the end, the fly too could not manage it anymore, and it lay dead in front of him. So, the death of the fly again is a, is a grim reminder of the death of his own project, his, his entire uh, preservation project that he had in his mind. So, the story ends uh, with this feeling of emptiness, a feeling of nothingness that the boss sits down with. Right? So, he sits down with the feeling of nothingness, uh, which, you know, you know, wretched feeling of nothingness, which sees him, uh, it, it consumes him completely, and he feels positively frightened. It says, you know, he feels really, really frightened, that he doesn't know what to do, he's got no future ahead of him, he can't remember anything. So, in a way, he becomes quite literally a timeless man. And I use the word timeless over here, uh, not in a positive sense, but in a very uh, nihilistic sense. Uh, is he becomes something which is completely annihilated by time. So, this is a revenge of time, as you can say. Uh, because, you know, uh, for a long period of time, the boss had defied time. The boss had said, I'm not going to be affected by time. I'm not going to be affected by the healing power of time. I'm someone who's, you know, beyond the power of time. I'm, I'm going to be unaffected completely by any effort of time. Uh, I'm going to have my own experience of loss, and it's going to be forever fresh in my mind. That's never going to change in my mind. But now we see time has come back and avenged itself on the boss. So, in a way, he can't remember what he was thinking of before. He doesn't have a future in front of him because the sun is dead. So, he becomes quite literally a timeless person. He's someone who is, quote unquote, liquidated by time, emptied of time, right? So, he becomes a timeless person in that sense of the word. And that's the reason why the story becomes so grim and dark in the end. So, as you can see, uh, the entire story can be read very, very, uh, it's a very fertile uh, text for gender studies and literature. It ha it's how one particular constructed masculinity is coming to an end. Uh, this entire hegemonic masculinity which the boss wants to embody is coming to an end. And we find the women in the particular short story, they get more agency, they have more power, they have more mobility, they have more financial agency, they move, they travel, they see the son's graves, come back and tell the, uh, the, 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 the old fathers who are either psychologically or medically unable to travel to the site of loss, uh, and they're the ones who are in control. And it's the fathers, the phallocentric patriarch, who are actually dying in this particular short story. So, symbolically, the boss is dead by the time the story ends. And so, he just sits there, unable to remember anything. Uh, so, again, the shift has been from solidity to fragility, as I mentioned. He sits down there like a fragile figure, right? Someone who's unable to think, unable to remember, unable to envision any future. So, he represents that particular scene, that particular ending represents uh, a bit of a death of that phallocentric principle that the boss had desperately tried to embody through his social success, through his professional success, through his son, through his emotional control. But now, that particular construct is now clinically died, like that of the fly. So, the fly is dead and so is the boss. This entire idea, this entire manly image of the boss that he wanted to project to the world and to himself is now finally dead. So, this concludes uh, our reading of The Fly. So, again, as you can see, it's a very complex short story. It's very historical. It's very authentically reflective of the gender conditions of the time after, immediately after the First World War. But more importantly, for the purpose of our course, we find how the entire dynamics of gender is dramatically reconfigured in Fly. How one particular kind of masculinity, which is hegemonic, the white, phallocentric masculinity, is coming to an end in this particular short story. And the entire short story can be read as a feminist critique of that kind of masculinity. So, we find this very strong female presence of the author outside the short story, who is critiquing this particular kind of masculinity. And the, the death of the boss is a very welcome death in a way, because that is the kind of masculinity which is abhorred by the woman, by the feminists. You know, this patriarchal, phallocentric, all-controlling, rational masculinity, which is desperate to win, which is desperate to you know, be superior, which is desperate to survive as a figure of authority, that kind of masculinity is coming to an end in this particular short story. So, this short story, historically, ideologically, culturally, uh, is a very interesting pointer to this uh, dynamic of gender change which happened after the First World War, how the dynamics of gender change, how you know, the gender locations change, how the, um, the agency, the relation between agency and gender was dramatically reconfigured after the First World War. We get all that, uh, we get a sense of all that in this particular short story, which again is deeply historical, but also purely as a literary text, a level of craft, it's a really, really sophisticated text. Uh, it's, it's a text which really, you know, foregrounds a moment of psychological intensity. It's so intense, it brings together sadism, masochism, combines those two together and really makes it psychologically complex. And, and it sort of crystallizes the moment 
uh, so beautifully uh, and that's the reason that the short story is regarded so highly regarded as a fine work of fiction the, the level of craft it's so rich at the level of craft that is regarded to be one of the best short stories ever written so this concludes our reading of fly i hope you enjoyed uh, this particular lecture and also the previous one so do read uh, the short story do read it in great details we have covered most of it uh, from the lenses of gender studies but you know there are more things that you can dig up but there are more things that you can find if you read it more carefully uh, in more details so this concludes our reading of fly thank you for your attention and the next lecture we'll move on to our next text for this particular course thank you very much <laughs>